ladies and gentlemen assalamu alaikum and a very warm welcome to all of you to this seminar on interplay of pluralism and exclusionism dynamics of relations between islam and the west a subject that has local as well as global significance besides immediate and long term implications for all of us yesterday's judgment of the apex court of pakistan and the adverse reactions or admirations on it from within and outside although are not unexpected have only highlighted that how important it is to reflect on such subjects within and across the societies in fact it is not the verdict only the discourse on the subject generated throughout the proceedings of asia bb's case at various levels and on other similar occasions in various parts of the world writings by salman rushdi taslima nasreen charlie hebdo shootings cartoon controversies on one side and very recently european human rights courts ruling on the other side these are to name a few all the signify signify how the evolving dynamics are shaping and influencing the interplay of various forces concerning pluralism and exclusionism while the impact or more appropriately the visibility of the impact may vary in degree depending upon the situations and a host of other factors the phenomena seems common and worldwide we all know ladies and gentlemen that interplay between the forces of pluralism and exclusionism is not in any way a new phenomena nevertheless what could be regarded now new is the kind of rapid transformation the world over with reference to the ideas and practices challenging pluralism more significantly considering the fact that forces challenging pluralism are gaining strength even in those societies and countries who declare pluralism and multiculturalism as their identity and secularism as their ideology consequently the intolerance protectionism and exclusionism are not only obvious at individual or societal level but have started playing powerfully at state and governmental levels in the name of populism while the us under president president donald trump may be regarded as one of the most known examples of challenging pluralism today the case of europe does not seem much different in most cases one finds a trend almost across the continent that far right parties are successful in attracting greater number of votes and consequently improving their num numerical strengths in the parliaments indeed they have successfully altered the political discourse shifting it from politically incorrect to acceptable political narrative response of european countries on the on the to the ongoing refugee crisis is one of the glaring examples in this context ladies and gentlemen i am afraid is it a kind of reverse journey that the world seems to have started it appears that we are returning back to the age of tribal dominers where a particular group held their claim on their territories belongings and statures and would not allow others to share them in my view the interplay of pluralism and exclusionism is the choice between regarding the humanity as a global global community or warring groups and when i say global as global community i do not mean to negate or downplay the diversity differences and distinctions of caste creed and color 
rather I mean respecting them and protecting them. And when I talk of thinking as groups, it means that we have kept in mind every fault line that has the potential to divide us, whether historical, religious, cultural, and economic. This is the overall context in which we are meeting today. Dr. Mumtaz Ahmed, in whose memory we are holding this session today, was among those individuals who have significantly contributed during the initial years of, of establishment of the Institute of Policy Studies. Last year, during an IPS seminar held in memory of Dr. Mumtaz, I had shared some memories and some of his handwritten notes that carried suggestions for organizational development. Indeed, we owe a lot to him when we look back to our journey of last almost 40 years and his off and on inputs, both formal and casual. We have a very distinguished panel today, and I certainly look forward to an interesting and thought-provoking discussion on the subject. Before I leave, I would like to particularly acknowledge the scholars from various parts of the world who are accompanying our speakers today in Pakistan. Some of them have left today, but some of them are still present here, and I would be failing in my duty if I do not specially thank my very dear Junaid Ahmed for coordinating this event with the IPS team and helping to bring all these scholars along. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you for IPS for inviting me to be with you today. It's really an honor and privilege for me to be with you. We have uh, old friends, Dr. Anis Ahmed, I've known for, I think, 40 years, if not more, <laughs> since the late 70s when we were together in the U.S. I spent about 40 years in the U.S. And uh, the topic, the theme here is exclusion and pluralism. I am a victim of exclusion when the power cannot uh, withstand dissent. That's what happens. They go after somebody. Um, I also knew Dr. Professor Mumtaz Ahmed, in whose memory we meet today to commemorate his long life of dedication, of work, uh, of being a person who is concerned about the fate of the Ummah. As a noted social and political scientist, he was very prominent as an academic, as a researcher, He'd been part of many institutions very great institutions, whether as a professor or as a visiting professor or as a fellow. He led many institutions in research and otherwise, and he has many contributions in many fields as author, as also public servant, and as a dedicated person. And that's how I knew him. You know, I came across him uh, in some conferences, in some uh, areas where we'd be discussing certain items as uh, a president of AMSS, American Muslim Social Scientists, one of the organizations that bring all Muslims in the U.S. together who, whose field of social science. Also as a humanitarian who believed in dialogue and interfaith, in peace building, in contributing to this in many, in many ways. And to give a speech in his memory is a great honor for me, especially after I was told Dr. Esposito was here last year doing the same. So it's really it's an honor for me to be here to talk to you. The topic I chose to talk about, which I believe is very much connected to the theme, is the dialectics between colonizers and colonized, and revolutionaries and counter-revolutionaries in the context of the Arab Spring. I usually don't write my speeches, but this is the exception where I wanted this to be the high level in honor and respect of Dr. Mumtaz Ahmed. Imperialism is the process by which the imperial country would use its enormous economic resources and military power against other nations 
in order to expropriate their lands, exploit their labor, seize their natural resources, plunder their capital, control their economic life, and open their markets in such a manner as to increase their power, enrich themselves, and advance their interests. Colonialism pursues power to usurp all resources of the others by keeping them weak and subservient through coercion or consent. For the past three centuries, imperialism created much of the world's disorder and danger. From Columbus and his comrades' brutal invasion of indigenous peoples in the Americas, to the Europeans' looting, pillaging, and colonization of much of Africa and Asia, to the current exploitation of labor, resources, and markets by unrestrained capitalism and multinational corporations. Colonialism used brute force, as well as sophisticated tools for control, domination, exploitation, and hegemony. The European colonizers killed tens of millions of indigenous people across North and South America, perhaps by as much as 130 million by, one count, by some counts, which is about 90 to 95% of their population before they were invaded. Belgium killed 10 to 15 million Congolese between 1835 and 1840, while the Dutch killed over 300,000 in Indonesia during the same period. France killed about 1 million Algerians in its 132-year occupation. Italians wiped two-thirds of the Libyans, while the British starved perhaps as much as 35 million in India during its occupation. Similarly, the Russians exterminated millions in certain, in certain Central Asia, while the new Western construct in the heart of the Muslim world, Israel, killed thousands and exiled over 60% of the Palestinians from their ancestral homeland. Colonizers hid their colonization expeditions under the mantra of spreading Western civilization. They obscured their real purpose and quest for wealth, control, and power by calling their campaigns mandates, protectorates, and commonwealth. They used massacres, destruction, and mayhem, not just against peoples and societies, but also against cultures, traditions, customs, history, and memory. They applied all means, ways, and tools. Nothing was beyond the limits. Divide and conquer, bribe and pamper, kill and lynch, employing all tools of death, especially if one dared to resist. They had the guns and powder, the bombs and planes, the tanks and artillery, massacring, oppressing, starving, torturing, transferring, exiling, enslaving, dehumanizing, raping, pillaging, looting, all in the name of the white man's burden to liberate dark-skinned peoples. Oftentimes, colonizers came with the aura of the Puritans and civilized people, moralizing and evangelizing, but with the gun in one hand and the Bible in the other. The justification for dehumanization and crushing of dignity and spirit was ready by claiming that their victims feel no pain, that the only language they understand is force, that the black man's brain is different, that the other races, be it African, Asian, Arab, or Indian, are inferior, that they are barbarians, fanatics, radicals, fundamentalists, terrorists, backwards, extremists, ignorant, uncivilized, that they don't respect their women or law and order and can't be trusted. Any resistance or opposition to the colonization project must then be crushed, annihilated, destroyed, and obliterated. A British governor of Bombay in 1875 wrote, we hold India by the sword. More than a century later, a prime minister of Israel said in 1988, amidst the first intifada uprising, the Palestinians must be crushed like grasshoppers and their heads smashed against the boulders and walls. 
as lands were raided and occupied, resources looted and plundered, labor exploited and enslaved, societies were restructured and cultures destroyed in the name of Western civilization. A campaign of cultural imperialism, as Edward Said called it, was in full swing. Languages, traditions, customs, religious beliefs, social practices were attacked and belittled. Societies were reorganized and divided along religious lines and ethnic groups and castes. <clears throat> to dominate and control, they divided us. Arab against Berber, Turk against Arab, Kurd against Turk, Black African against Arab African, Arab against Persian, Sunni against Shia, Pashtun against Tajik, Punjabi against Sindhi, Muslim against Hindu, Jew against Muslim, Muslim against Christian, in a society where all these communities largely lived peacefully and in harmony for thousands of years. Artificial borders across Africa, Asia, and the entire Muslim world were drawn in London, Paris, Brussels, Berlin, and St. Petersburg. Hollywood, Hollywood, this great global university shaped our perception of the master and our understanding of the self and the other. For example, I remember how the movie Midnight Express, which I watched in the late 70s, shaped my perception of Turkey and fear of the Turks for a long time before, because of its portrayal of Turkish people as brutal, heartless, oppressive. Thousands of books, movies, plays, sitcoms, novels, and programs have been produced not only to poison the minds of the white man and women and inoculate them against brown and black skinned people, but also to hijack the positive self-image of the latter and colonialize them so that they would forever feel inferior. Furthermore, new legal structures were erected and imposed and a new education systems were built and nurtured based on Western notions of ideas, knowledge, history, science, philosophy, and law. For centuries, colonialism was a hammer that saw every colonized community as a nail. But as Franz Fanon said, in the colonial context, the settler only ends his work of breaking the native when the latter admits loudly and intelligibly the supremacy of the white man's values. The challenge is and has been the capacity of the colonized to first say no and resist until the colonizer is repelled and defeated, and then to cleanse colonized minds from all the harmful effects and manifestations of colonization and rebuild a new society. Let me now turn to the context of the Arab society's encounter with colonialism. Ever since Napoleon Bonaparte invaded Egypt in 1798, the relationship between the West and the Arab Muslim East has been contentious and convoluted. Although this military leader of the first French Republic conquered Egypt for strategic reasons in his rivalry with the British and the Ottomans, the Muslim Arabs in this region, of this region later dubbed the Middle East by an American naval felt vulnerable, naval officer felt vulnerable, exposed, and weak. However, as early as the 8th century, this same region, the cradle of Islamic civilization, represented the world's most advanced achievements in many fields, including philosophy, education, science, technology, architecture, administration, economic development, and trade. As the Ottoman Turks took control of this vital region by the 16th century, the gap between Europe and the Middle East widened, especially in military technology. So it was relatively easy for the French expedition to take over Egypt. But what proved to be hard was to keep this strategic piece of geography. Egyptian resistance to this early imperial invasion was ferocious. Within three years, Napoleon had to abandon his dreams and withdrew. But the immediate consequence of this brief interaction between East and West had a tremendous long-term impact. French laws and courts, as well as education and administrative systems with their strict secular outlook were introduced and slowly dominated the public discourse. 
A new class of elites was created that was tied to the much wealthier and technologically advanced European foreigners after the attempt by Egypt's new governor, Muhammad Ali Pasha, to establish a strong modern Egypt was thwarted and rolled back by the British, though independently aided by the high court in Istanbul. By the early 20th century, many countries in the Middle East were under direct European colonial rule, including Algeria in 1830 and Tunisia in 1881 by the French, Egypt and Sudan by the British, and Libya by Italy. In the aftermath of World War I, the rest of the Middle East came under a direct colonial dominance or influence as the Sykes-Picot Accord of 1916 divided the sphere of influence and direct occupation between Britain and France with Iraq, Palestine, Transjordan, and the small Chechdams along the Gulf falling to the British, and with the Levant going to the French. The significance of the religious and cultural aspects of occupation did not escape the colonialist powers. Upon entering Jerusalem in December 1917, British General Edmund Allenby remarked, and I quote, the wars of the Crusades are now complete, end quote. While French military general Henri Gouraud, who conquered Damascus in July 1920, stood at Salah al-Din's grave, kicked it, and said, and I quote, the Crusades have ended now. Awake, Salah al-Din, we have returned. My presence here consecrates the victory of the cross over the crescent. Furthermore, by November 1917, British Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour issued a, declara a declaration that pledged Britain's full support to the international Zionist movement in establishing a national home in Palestine for the Jewish people as soon as the British control over the country was achieved. For the next half century, most Arab societies were engaged in national liberation and resistance movements against colonial powers, leading to national independence for many Arab countries, including Syria and Lebanon in the 40s, Egypt, Sudan, Iraq, and Tunisia in the 50s, Kuwait, Algeria, and Libya in the 60s, and the Emirates and the Persian Gulf and South Yemen in the 70s. In addition to the national liberation struggle that spread across the Arab world throughout this period, another parallel conflict in Palestine between the Zionist movement and the Palestinian and Arab people was taking place, eventually leading to several wars in 48, 56, 73, 82, the first Intifada, the second Intifada, the 2006 war, and the subsequent wars in Gaza. The direct impact of 1948 and 67 wars was the displacement and exile over half of the Palestinian population in, in many countries outside Palestine, and especially in refugee camps in Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. Their numbers now exceed 7 million people. While Israel was established in 48 on 78% of historical Palestine, by 1967 it had total control of not only Palestine, but also the Sinai and the Syrian Golan Heights. The direct effects of the 1973 war were not just effectively taking Egypt out of the Arab-Israeli conflict in exchange for returning the Sinai to Egypt, to Egypt with limited sovereignty, but more importantly, consolidating the Israeli occupation over the occupied territories, particularly the West Bank and the Golan Heights. By the end of the first decade of the 21st century, frustrated citizens across the Arab world had had enough. Corrupt and weak regimes that stole billions while relying on a ruthless security state, Western humiliation in Iraq and Central Asia, Afghanistan, untamed Israeli aggression and arrogance, economic stagnation and senseless violence by extremist groups like Al-Qaeda and Daesh that don't represent the aspirations of the people across the region. Meanwhile, they see countries in the region such as Turkey, Iran, and Israel developing economically and progressing in many fields while their societies either stagnate or even go backwards. The political horizons across the Arab world were cl closed shut. And as the, world, as the Arab world was boiling, all that was needed was a spark. It came when a, fr when a frustrated Tunisian vendor was prevented from selling his goods and suffered humiliation by a police officer and set himself on fire in December 2010. As Lenin once said, there are decades when nothing happens, and there are weeks when decades happen. Within days, a revolutionary spirit engulfed the country and resulted in the Tunisian pres uh, president, its dictator of 23 years, fleeing the country after 28 days of uprising. 
Soon, the same spirit inflamed Egypt as millions took to the streets, forcing the ouster of the Egyptian president, its dictator of 29 years, after only 18 days. By February 2011, tens of thousands of people across the Arab world in Yemen, Libya, Morocco, Jordan, Bahrain, Syria, were in the streets demanding freedom and change, but were soon were repelled. What was once unthinkable became routine. Within, eight, within 18 months, four regimes were toppled and democratic elections were taking place. The revolutions and transformations taking place in the Arab world were nothing short of remarkable. But soon the counter-revolutionary forces in collusion, in collusion with Western imperialism, viciously overturned all the gains of the Arab Spring, this nascent phenomenon, and crushing any hopes for the end of repression or corruption or aspirations for democratic governance and economic prosperity. This was not a betrayal of declared values and principles by Western powers. It was a continuation of its legacy to dominate and control, to disrespect the will of the indigenous people, and to deny their right to freedom, dignity, equality, self-determination, and expression. History is the witness. For over six decades, whenever the people in Muslim societies try to assert their peaceful democratic rights, their will is suppressed and reversed. It happened in Iran in 1953, in Algeria in 1992, in Palestine in 2006, and in Egypt in 2013. The message is unmistakable. There are seven key challenges facing Arab societies today. Indeed, many Muslim societies. The first challenge is the challenge of legitimacy. For decades, political legitimacy in the Arab world was bestowed in the basis of hereditary rule, the barrel of the gun, or resistance and opposition to Israel and Western colonialism. However, after the Arab Spring, it is clear that the legitimacy, this legitimacy must be conferred through the will of the people. The future of political stability in the Arab world, including monarchies, will ultimately be tied to free and fair elections. If it doesn't happen, there will be no stability. Secondly, the challenge of identity. There is no doubt that the Arab Islamic culture has shaped this region for over 1400 years. Thus, Islam as a religion, history, culture, and legal framework has been an integral part of its polity and society. The Arab Spring phenomena that brought political freedom and openness has also allowed the question of identity to become front and center. Many secular groups, liberal and leftist, have resented the success of the groups that belong to the so-called political Islam. But on a more fundamental level, some of the secular and liberal groups that have failed to garner popular support in the ballot box still reject any public role for religion and society. Increasingly, it seems that this challenge must be settled by the peoples of the region who continuously choose to affirm their cultural identity while rejecting religious extremism as well as unrestrained secularism. Thirdly, the challenge of independence. Lacking political legitimacy, the regimes toppled by the Arab revolutions and uprising, as well as those who desperately now cling to power, have for many decades relied on their patrons, whether in the West or the Soviet Union or Russia as its successor, to stay in power. But people across the region no longer accept that their elected governments be client states or to follow the dictates of the West. Rather, they expect their governments to chart an independent course of action, notwithstanding foreign pressures, as long as they respect the will of the people, adhere to the national interest of the country, and value public opinion. It should be emphasized, though, that independence in this context is not only political, but also includes economic, social, and cultural spheres. Fourth the challenge of sectarianism and ethnocentrism. This challenge is probably one of the most dangerous and fault lines, and uh, uh, the most dangerous threats and fault lines facing Arab societies from within, particularly the Sunni Shi'i and Arab Kurdish divides. There are at least three countries in the region with majority Shia populations, namely Iran, Iraq, and Bahrain, as well as plurality in Lebanon. There are also significant Shia populations in Saudi Arabia and the Gulf countries. It appears that this challenge could be overcome on two levels, religious and political. On the religious side, the major scholars of both sects must come together and reach a historic rapprochement 
and resolve their historic differences, which are mainly political. But more importantly, the political understanding or alliance must be achieved between the major countries in the region, especially Iran, Turkey, and Pakistan. A very diff difficult feat to achieve in the current regional power structure and state of affairs. Another threat is the potential insistence of the large Kurdish population to establish a Kurdish state at the expense of the territorial integrity of four countries, namely Iraq, Iran, Turkey, and Syria. So far, many Kurds have been content with full autonomy. However, outside forces, particularly Israel and the United States, have been quietly encouraging the Kurds to secede and establish their own country despite a potentially devastating conflict with their neighbors. Fifth, the challenge of social justice and economic development. The main slogan of the people in the street during the Arab Spring was freedom, dignity, and social justice. If constitutional and democratic governance promise freedom and independence yields dignity and respect, the challenge of establishing social justice cannot be achieved without fundamental restructuring of the power and wealth relationships within the whole society. If Islamic businessmen in any country were to replace the corrupt regime businessmen while maintaining the unjust and unrestrained capitalist mentality of monopoly, exploitation, and without protections, regulations, or limits, then the whole experiment will ultimately collapse. We cannot just paint Islam and think it's going to work. In all spheres and indicators of economic development, such as poverty rate, GDP, unemployment, literacy rates, lack of health care, subpar education institutions, deteriorating infrastructure, corruption, nepotism, rigid bureaucracy, the new democratic governments or the emerging democratic order have to not only deliver vast improvements in all these spheres within a short period of time, but also develop a system where all the gains and reforms are legally protected and institutionalized. Six, the challenge of modernity. If popular Islamist groups were to gain any power across the Middle East, or if Islam becomes a dominant culture and legal framework, many issues will come to the fore as the forces that champion the literal interpretations of Islam clash with other moderate Islamic and, and secular voices. What is needed is for the outside forces to give space for the issues to be sorted out internally and without interference. In the most important Arab societies, such as Egypt, Syria, Iraq, Sudan, and across North Africa, voices of moderate interpretations of Islamic law and culture are much stronger than the extremists. Over time, even the most of the conservative voices tend to accept modern interpretations and viewpoints. But outside forces simply need to stay in the background and out of this internal debate. Seventh and final challenge, the challenge of geography and of Israel. Most geopolitical experts consider North Africa and the Middle East as the center of the world as well as the most important strategic region with its control of over half of the world's energy resources and strategic trade routes and sea lanes such as the Suez Canal. Moreover, Europe feels vulnerable with the proximity of over 200 million on its southern shores, which makes it imperative that the region does not explode or export chaos and instability. Furthermore, there are three powerful neighbors to the Arab world that present strategic challenges namely Iran, Turkey, and Israel. Though rivals, the first two are considered potential allies, while the latter as a strategic threat because of its aggressive and expansionist policies, as well as its continuous persecution of the Palestinians and denial of their rights. Within the next decade, there will be shifting alliances within the region and with forces outside, outside it, including not only the NATO countries, but also China, Russia, and other emerging international powers. Such alliances will determine not only the future of this region, but also of the whole world. As the Arab Spring demonstrated, if and when the people across the Arab world rise up again and assert their power, it is very difficult to see how Israel would be able to still be viable in its current state of affairs. In his groundbreaking study, Orientalism, Edward Said captured the essence of imperialism 
when he spoke of the French enterprise in Egypt from the perspective of the colonizer, as it was, and I quote, to restore a region from its present barbarism to its former classical greatness, to instruct the Orient in the ways of the modern West, end quote. But from the standpoint of the colonized, Middle East historian Wang Kohl prospectively concluded in his book, Napoleon's Egypt, that the West colonialist enterprise ended because, and I quote, Middle Eastern politicians and public ceased being willing to cooperate with it and because they had gained the tools to stand up to it, end quote. And there lies the real potential for the future. The Arab Spring phenomena had a tremendous promise to the hopes and aspirations of the people across the region. But with this promise came enormous challenges and grave setbacks. People across the region still reject the status quo and yearn for change. But, but, but this change will only come when a new alliance of revolutionaries and free and friendly societies is assembled, which are based on building a consensus, a consensus of vision, will, and action to confront colonialism and its local allies and build new societies. It's a process that starts with few dedicated visionaries and then grows and flourishes. As the great sociologist Margaret Mead said, never doubt that small group of thoughtful, concerned citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Thank you very much. You used the word courage, which is very uh, generous of you. It really was a product of my own dull-wittedness. So imagine you're in a faculty office at the University of Texas at Austin on 9-11. You're seeing what's happening. Uh, as someone who comes from the political left and has a critique of American empire, you realize that there is a coming aggression in the world that is going to wreak havoc and you concerned. So you sit down and you write an op-ed that has the tone you just heard, and then you send it to the largest newspaper in the state of Texas, thinking, well, this might be a, a, a useful thing to get this kind of analysis into the public domain right after 9-11. <laughs> that, was, that was a joke. Okay, my point is, the reason I sent it was not that I was courageous. I was too stupid to realize what was going to happen. <laughs> it's my own dull-wittedness, my own naivete that leads to these things. Uh, I really didn't expect what happened. As a result of that, and the reason I'm here today, is because the president of the University of Texas, my boss, was under so much pressure when there was a public reaction against my essay and subsequent writings, that he was being pressured to fire me, but he couldn't. I was tenured. And so in its, instead of firing me, he issued a statement in which, for the first time in anybody's memory, by name, he called out a specific faculty member, and he called me a fool in public. Okay, so that put me into the news. I'm here because my boss called me an idiot. That's the only reason I'm here. Right? My analysis wasn't particularly original, I wasn't particularly articulate, I just got caught in that particular uh, little maelstrom. Now, I also want to recognize that there are worse things than having your boss call you an idiot. For instance, there is being harassed by the US government, having charges false and fraudulent charges brought against you, being jailed pending a trial that was really a, a circus, which when you're acquitted, then leads the government to try and manufacture new charges to put you back in jail, eventually leaving you under a house arrest until when the case has finally fallen apart and the fraud that that prosecution was was revealed, the United States government summarily deports you. Right? That is what happened to my colleague on the roster right now, Dr. Al Aryan, and I want to recognize that if you give me a choice between having your boss call you a fool or go through that, I'll take calling, being called a fool by your boss any day. And I want to recognize this is a test of your analytic powers. I've been told the Pakistani intellectual class is extremely smart, so this is to test that. What do you think was the meaningful difference between Sammy and myself that led to his fate versus mine? <coughs> 
That was a joke too. My humor is going nowhere today. <laughs> I'm gonna have to retool this talk really quickly. The point is, of course, I'm born in the US, I'm white. Sammy of Palestinian heritage uh, was at risk in a way I wasn't. So that public row over my essay led to me uh, speaking and writing part of the anti-war movement, which led me to meeting Junaid Ahmed, which led me to meeting Mumtaz, and that's where I wanted to come back. Um, in several trips uh, to Pakistan, as well as to Virginia, where Mumtaz taught, uh, I got to meet this man, and, and it was a real, it, to say it was an honor it doesn't do it justice. I learned from this man. Uh, the academy in the United States is populated with very smart people that you don't want to spend too much time with. <laughs> uh, and Mumtaz was exactly the opposite, one of those deeply intellectual people who was also at the same time deeply human, right? who treated people in the way that you hope you will be treated. And when Junaid asked me to be part of this, the first term, the first idea that came to mind when I thought of Mumtaz was his moral imagination. His, the incredibly expansive moral imagination of the man. The ability to recognize the importance of things like tribe and religion and country, how deeply those identities shape us, yet also the ability to think beyond that. To recognize that it's not a choice between the local and the global. It's not a choice between the parochial and the cosmopolitan. That to be fully human in the world today is to live in the dialogue between those two, between the local and the global. Right? And uh, that's what I took away from all of the um, wonderful time I was able to spend with him. And I want to sort of think about that moral imagination at the end of my talk. The other thing I think Mumtaz was extremely good at was both using the analytic tools that we create in intellectual life without ever being trapped by them. To recognize that the concepts we come up with to figure out how the world works, right, that allow us to analyze with precision can also become traps. Right? That the idea of patriotism, for instance, the idea that one gives to one's country a certain loyalty can easily turn dark and trap us in relationships to power that we should be challenging. He, he knew that these concepts were important to understanding the world, but if we started to use generalizations to obscure reality, that we were in trouble. So Islam and the West concepts we use to understand how the world is organized, but also contra uh, concepts that can start to obscure reality when we believe they mean more than they do. And in fact, many of us in the room have experiences of moving beyond the limits of those. I, I think of Junaid. So I come from a Christian tradition, uh, Junaid, a Muslim. I realized in my conversations with him and in learning about Muslim theology from Junaid that I had much more in common with him theologically than I had with most of my Christian brothers and sisters in the United States. Right? So what is Christianity in the West? What is Islam in the East? These things, if we allow them to be reified in simplistic ways, will trap us. And I think Mumtaz was exceedingly good at both using but not being trapped by those kinds of concepts. So uh, I think because I'm from the United States, although I'm, I want to focus on other things, I do have to, to recognize that your presentation, Dr. El Aryan, was a direct challenge to the United States. It was a harsh critique. You were throwing on the table that challenge to me, to defend my country against the extreme rhetoric of this man. And you're wondering, am I going to respond? Am I going to stand up for my own country? After all, I'm a patriot, yes? from Texas. Yep, damn right. Uh, sorry, but you were right about pretty much everything as far as I can tell. So I, uh, if one was hoping for fireworks in you know, the, this debate, I, I have no fireworks to offer them. Uh, and in the interest of time, I'm going to move to the, the, con the this 
idea that Mumtaz had this incredibly expansive moral imagination. He was not afraid to go toward questions that challenged us. And I want to put one more on the table. Uh, Sammy talked about what we might think of as the struggles within the human family to create a decent and fair world, a just world. And we know those struggles are difficult enough, right? both within our own communities and on a global scale, that the distribution of wealth and power does not conform to anyone's basic moral principles. That's the kind of irony of living in the world today. The existing distribution of wealth and power is not consistent with anyone's moral principles. And we all have moral principles, even in the US. Okay, that was kind of a joke too. Uh, <laughs> huh? Yes. And those moral principles are widely shared across the world. Principles like the inherent dignity of all people, the basic human yearning for solidarity, the need for equality. All of those are values that are endorsed in my Christian tradition, in Islam, in Hinduism. These are not unique to any particular tradition, secular or theological, yet every society is based on systems and structures of power that make it impossible for us to live our own moral principles. That's hard enough to try and figure out how to overcome the problems of nationalism and capitalism, of patriarchy and white supremacy is hard enough. So let's put it another equally difficult, perhaps even more difficult problem on the table in this attempt to expand our moral imagination and that is the ecological. The recognition that whatever the problems within the human family, the relationship of the human species to the larger living world is now at a point of deep crisis. Right? To use a phrase I'm fond of, I would suggest we are all apocalyptic now. Brothers and sisters, I'm here to testify. If you don't mind, I'm going to take off my jacket because I feel myself getting overheated. Channel in here the Holy Spirit for you, brothers and sisters. Just kidding again. Okay, I use this term, we are all apocalyptic now, and when I use the word apocalyptic, many people, especially because I live in Texas, say to themselves, oh my goodness, where is this crazy American going with this? Is he going to start talking about rivers of blood and lakes of fire and the revelation that the rapture is coming and the... No, I'm not going to do that. Don't worry. I want to focus on this phrase, we are all apocalyptic now, and suggest that if we are honest in our evaluation of the world, we should all be apocalyptic now. Now, what do I mean by apocalyptic? In the US, at least, that word is often associated with the book of Revelation, the last and truly craziest book of the, of the Christian Bible. Uh, it's a, a, and the theologian uh, to my right will, I think, endorse this. It's uh, a book that can be like all theological texts be interpreted and is often interpreted not as a call to the end of the world but a challenge to the empire of the day to the Roman Empire but however one interprets it the word apocalypse does not mean the end of the world it means a coming to clarity a lifting of the veil it's the Greek the Latin revelation means the same and that's what I mean when I say we are all apocalyptic now we all have to allow ourselves to see clearly a world that is so difficult and so painful to look at. If you look at any measure of the health of the planet, the health of the ecosystems of the planet on which our own lives are based, as I always say, the news is bad, it's getting worse, and it's getting worse faster than even the most uh, cynical would imagine. We are facing what a friend of mine always called multiple cascading ecological crises, not just climate change. Climate change is the most dramatic, but not climate change alone. The dramatic loss in biodiversity, species extinction, so extreme that some are calling it the sixth great extinction in the history of the planet. Soil loss and soil degradation, the statistics on soil erosion alone should have us panicking. Right? The chemical contamination of not only the land and the water, but our own bodies. All of the news about the health of this planet and our health on it is bad, it is getting worse, 
and it is getting worse faster than we expected. That is a reality, and if it is a reality, it must become part of our analysis of the world. Yet, the reason it is so hard is it challenges our moral imagination. What do I mean by this? I was born in 1958. The challenge that was always posed in my lifetime was, how are we going to feed the world, yes? We must feed the world, a growing population. We must marshal all of our technology and our science to increase agricultural productivity. We will feed the world. That was the challenge posed in my lifetime. I want to suggest there's a different moral challenge today. Right now, there are 7.5 billion people on the planet. Estimates are that it will rise to nine. The fact is, and it is a cold and very difficult fact to confront, but the fact is this planet cannot sustain nine billion people indefinitely. This planet is going to see a reduction in the human population. Whether it's in my lifetime or my child's lifetime, I don't know, but this world we have lived in based on expansive amounts of cheap energy to allow a dramatic expansion of the human population well beyond the carrying capacity of the planet is going to come to an end. And that means human beings on this planet are going to face the moral challenge of how to deal with a world that is declining in population. And, and I think if we are honest with ourselves, look at the systems, economic, political, and social systems currently in place, and if we were to wonder, is that dramatic decline in the human population going to happen in a sensible, planned way based on principles of justice, or is it going to happen in a blunt and ugly way based on principles of domination? I think we have to be honest with ourselves. Now, that is a challenge to our moral imagination. When I make this argument, I'm often told that it's a downer, it's depressing. Why don't you focus on the positive? If this is real, then to ignore it is a downer, is depressing, is an evasion. And I think those of us committed not only to intellectual work but political work know that you can fashion no vision of the future if you cannot contend with the realities on the ground. And if we fashion a vision of the future that does not recognize this, I think even the most hopeful vision is doomed to fail. So I want to leave you with that, that challenge to become apocalyptic. Don't worry, you don't have to convert to Christianity to do it. Although if anybody wants to come down to the altar, I'm ready to save... Okay, never mind. I'm pushing this one a little too far. I get it. All right. But if you think this is somehow unkind or inappropriate, I want to leave you with a quote from a Russian novel, and, and uh, Mumtaz was a fan of Russian literature, uh, from the Brothers Karamazov. And it is a, a line that I first ran into years ago and has been in the back of mind, my mind ever since. And one of the characters in that book says, and this is where I'll end, um, in discussing the, the need for love, that the world doesn't survive without love. But he cautions against too sentimental a notion of love and says, love in action is a harsh and dreadful thing compared with love in dreams. Thank you. I uh, request Dr. Ulrich Krau to give us his input about the topic. He's uh, an expert in social theology and religion economic issues. Um, yeah, he's the co-founder of Kairos Europa, is that how you pronounce it? Uh, a European network of justice, peace, and creation initi initiatives for a just and tolerant society. Well, Mr. President, moderator, colleagues, friends, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am very, very grateful that Junaid invited me to this, il we have a German word, illustre. Huh? Uh, I don't know whether that is also an English uh, company. Um, it's a wonderful occasion. Don't fear it. I have only 10 minutes other than the first speakers, so uh, you can breathe a little bit. And also I wanted to say <coughs> to Bob 
uh, that the, 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 your chief huh, uh, did call you a fool, you please compare it when I published a book together with Jews, Christians, Palestin Palestinian Christians, um, and also Muslims with Junaid. One of the hierarchy of my church called me, I am doing blasphemy because we criticize the state of Israel. So uh, you see that is also something that you have to face. Now very quickly, uh, because this limited time, what um, uh, Professor al uh, put before you, um, I nearly in the same words published in 1992, uh, Europe in the world system is just this possible, was the title of the booklet, and it was exactly this genocidal base of the European imperialist 500 years, and all the resistance raised against it, and we had a big parliament from below, people's parliament with 700 people in Strasbourg, challenging this 500 years like you did. Um, now, but recent years I tried to understand what kind of civilization makes this possible. And I found out the civilization making this kind of genocide and robbery up to the land robbing now in Palestine um, possible starts about 2,800 years ago and I'm not saying that because of historical interest, but because it's the same time when the world religions until today started to form a certain resistance to what started 2,800 years ago. So therefore, my work in the last um, years and decades has been to more and more understand what happened in this civilization, the climax of which the climax and final stage of which we are experiencing now because the murderous civilization becomes suicidal. I don't know whether you have seen the book following up what you said, self-burning of humanity. That is what you said as apocalyptics and I'm also supporting you as a theologian. Apocalyptics is literature of resistance, resistance of empire, we could go into the details, but there is not the time for that. So how did it start? It started by linking money and military. This is how it started. Because before that, economy was does, done in different forms of community economy. Then military was professionalized in the forms of mercenary, about 800 before our common era. Now, what happened was very, very dramatic over the coming centuries. Number one, uh, this disembedded economy of the individual in the market somehow caused people to have the idea I can only buy my living when I have as much money as possible. So it started what I call the greedy money civilization. And at the same time, because then having as much money as possible, accumulate money, of course links very easily with empire because it's the same kind of expansionism and once money has been turned into coins, you need mines, you conquer mines, etc. Um, as a matter of fact, it, <laughs> it uh, started very well in Eurasia, from Greek to China. You had similar developments all over, I mean, starting in the 8th century, then six, uh, around 600, co coining the metal, circulating as money. And so <clears throat> this not only split societies through debt mechanisms and land loss of the one and collecting big land ownership on the other side, 
but also it changed the mind. Besides communicating in community with language, a new way of communicating was calculating. So it was the, it was the calculative mind, the egocentric mind. What is in it for me is the key question. How, how do I calculate in this situation? So therefore, then this developed until treasure building and then coming into changing money into capital, which means it's not only money as an instrument, but you make money a goal. So profit has to be reinvested, etc. All that started then again with linking that capitalist starting point with the Crusades. It was exactly at that point when the Crusades started in the 11th century that you had this new phase of turning money into capital so it must grow, capital must grow. First in commercial terms and also usury terms. And then of course, coming to the next route, you put this kind of necessity to grow into production and then you have industrial capitalism. Now this is a, and now you have the big black rocks around the world, capital managers, organizers, buying up all economy and banks and everything. So this is now the climax, so that everything has to work for turning life into money. And where it does not work with the financial system, you have the military. And so what is happening now with the right-wing <laughs> developments is exactly the consequence of this. Uh, the peace researcher, and I know in the Defense University they have a peace research institute, having worked with Galtung, Johann Galtung, okay? His formula is fascism is Western civilization in extremis. So any time when you do not, when the, the money mechanisms are not enough to subdue people or exploit people, exclude people, then you take out the iron fist out of the glove. And then you know what happens. So this is in a very short nutshell, how I see this 2,800 years of ex exclusive, excluding, exploiting, killing and being suicidal form of civilization. Now, this is of course apocalyptic language. Thank you, Bob. <clears throat> uh, but it is not, reality is worse than what I say, I tell you. Many people in the world know that. Okay, now what about religion? What about religion? Now, it was exactly in those times from the eighth century before the common era and up to the prophet Muhammad that many religions in many parts of the world, so with plurality of cultures, raised resistance forms of thinking, of believing, of connecting, and you, st you ended up with love, and the word of love in Greek is agape, and we translate it with solidarity. That is why our main focus is the question of interreligious solidarity for justice. That is the key formula in order to replace that killing and suicidal civilization with a new culture of life. Now, <clears throat> just quickly, because the time is so short. Now, I said from Greek to China, in Greece, you have the tragedy and you have Socratic philosophy reacting to this kind of civilization, individualized, greedy, etc. situation, social splitting, etc., etc. In China, you have Lao Tse and Confucius. Lao Tse saying, the real strong is the water. This is because a water even washes the rock over the tides. So the male strong military will be overcome by the female soft power. 
And therefore you need, if you want to have a good life, to balance this. So that's the kind of balancing against that kind of imperial, greedy, male type of empire building. Confucius say, put things in relations so that the whole society can live a good life. And then in India, at the same time, the Buddha says, what does make people suffer? Three poisons. Greed, aggressiveness and violence, and illusion. Because money creates the illusion when you have as much money as possible, you can have as much life as possible. That already Aristoteles analyzed and also the prophet Muhammad. You can read it in the Quran. Now then to mention other just briefly, the prophets, the first of the prophets calling for justice as the resistance form against this type of selling the poor for silver. That's one of his sentences. But let justice roll down like a river from the mountains like here. And then you have all the others coming, Micah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, etc. And they were, of course, a rejected minority, first of all. But when the catastrophes came, then they started to put this in legal form in the Torah, which was, in the sense, a first social law for protecting the poor, the indebted, etc., etc. Now then comes Jesus at the top of the first period in the Roman Empire and says the key theological and human decision to make is between God and Mammon. And God is exactly what you recite from the Quran, the merciful, the just, hmm? and the compassionate. So because money rules out compassion, it calculates. And it is the winner mentality. Huh? But religion, the Abrahamic religions, right through to your prophet, is compassion, is mercy, is justice, is solidarity. So that is why, I think, we have to rethink religion on the basis of our original sources. You know, you know it very well. Religion has power over people. Now, this is why the powers that be are interested to co-opt that power for their own purposes. And so, therefore, we have a kind of, uh, of ty a type of religion which is allying with power instead with justice and compassion. So therefore, in all religions, to ha you, you find that turnaround, that perversion of religion. And then, of course, you have those coward forms of religion, saying, oh, be nice to each other. Religion is, makes good interpersonal interrelationships, but are silent on injustice. <coughs> that is the second form. But the third form is the original form, and you can read it in the Bible, you can read it in the Quran, you can see it in the Buddhist, and you can see it in Taoism and Confucianism, you can read it everywhere. And that is resist injustice, be compassionate, give priority to the downtrodden, give priority to those who seem weak, because only when all together can be happy, we finally also happy. Because you can even check that in our economic faculties. They have a discipline called happiness research. And do you know what they find out? In the moment, I mean, everybody needs to have enough. Without that, no happiness is possible. But once you have reached that point, further accumulation cannot increase your happiness. Because what really makes up for happiness is, I'm finished. <laughs>
That was the last sentence. Thank you, you come to the right time. What really makes up for happiness is succeeding good relations. Not only personally, but socially with nature. Yeah? So relational religion is the response to the excluding money structures. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you for a very enlightening talk. Uh, next uh, respondent is Pepe Escobar. Mr. Pepe Escobar is from Brazil. He's a geopolitical analyst and journalist for Russia Today, Sputnik, Press TV, and formerly Al Jazeera. Thank you. It's an enormous pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm very fond of Pakistan, and I spent maybe the most momentous year in modern history, almost six months of 2001, I was here. I was here, went to Afghanistan, I was back, then went to Af <coughs> Afghanistan again, and then I came back here. So especially after this absolutely outstanding presentation of the horror story of uh, the white man across the world and Islamic lands, I would have nothing to add, really. So I, I was thinking, you know, okay, what am I going to say that could have any interest in terms of what Xi Jinping would <laughs> define as a people-to-people -people exchange? And in this case, about a Westerner in relation to Islam. Well, okay, le let me try to tell you a story. Then. A story of a, a white Christian kid an American from the South, which is a completely different story, as our American from the North knows. So uh, I grew up under the shade of the hegemon, uh, like Cioran, one of my favorite philosophers, an Eastern European, always define it very well. If you grow up in the periphery of the empire, you have a much better perspective to understand how the empire works. So I try to apply that to my personal life and my learning curve, in fact. So uh, this white boy, w one of the, the streams, the family streams was Spanish, which means, as you all know, major genocide, including the Spanish Inquisition, of course. So ever since I was a kid, I had this gut feeling I said, maybe <laughs> in a very American way, nah, this thing doesn't add up. But of course, I didn't have the instruments or the intellectual powers to understand why. And uh, the other stream of the family is Dutch, which also means white colonialism, in Asia, for that matter. And obviously, I knew nothing about Islam. So, uh, Little by little, I started to discover Asia. When I was still in high school, probably, I became a big fan of uh, the Egyptians, and especially the Persians. And uh, this would later turn into my great appreciation of everything related to, to Persia and Iran, and my many trips to Iran, and a long relationship with Iran. But, uh, Okay, so the only way to learn about Islam would be to go on the road and have Xi Jinping style person-to-person -person exchange. It took a long time, of course. I started first as um, when I chose the, my career, which was my career is going to be go around the world. So I chose to be a global nomad very, very early on purpose because uh, the culture that I grew up in, which was it's, ve it's a very, very powerful culture, Brazil, because it's a mix of everything. And includes Japanese, includes Lebanese, but it does not include Islam. So the only way to learn would be to go on the road, which, w it, which is what I did after I moved to Asia. So when I moved to Asia, I needed to understand China, India, and Southeast Asia. This is what happened the first few years. Then I slowly started drifting towards the Islamic lands. 
And I ended up, when 9-11 uh, happened, and you know, I happened to be in Pakistan even before, and in Afghanistan even before, I was in Islamic lands when 9-11 happened, which was a quite peculiar point of view from a Westerner that started from scratch to learn about Islam. And uh, over these years, uh, my person-to-person -person exchange in Islamic lands led to absolutely outstanding moments. For instance, be in uh, the main mosque in Kabul, the Blue Mosque, discussing with the head mullah, something that obviously he didn't want to discuss, like the Enlightenment, for instance. I was trying to <laughs> make him understand that we had something called the Renaissance in the West and also the Enlightenment. It was fantastic because I, I needed to know what they didn't know or being in a calm discussing with Iranian Ayatollahs the deepest meanings of Shiite theology, which forced me to understand at least a little bit of Shiite theology and read about it and try to, and try to understand it from the inside, even if it was in an English translation. And after, during, the Iraq, even, uh, during the Iraq war and after the Iraq war immediately, uh, talking to tribal, um, heads in Ambar province, for instance, in trying to understand their concept of uh, Islam, um, their concept of uh, militant Sunni, not quite e extremist Islam. They, they were not crazy Wahhabis in Ambar province. They were basically defending their lands, in fact. And, of course, in between an absolutely crucial moment, which was the last time I went to visit Palestine, which was a long time ago, it was even before 9-11, in fact. Uh, I was at uh, Israel, Tel Aviv's airport. I was going to Jordan, I think. And obviously, uh, where have you been? All over Palestine. Bad answer. <laughs> So this means they wanted to open my laptop and look at my articles and I said, look, I'm a journalist, I'm not gonna show you anything. So they called the head of security, big, big thing. And then after we had like one hour, I said, look, if I want, I can show you what I wrote. If you want to say anything, go to my embassy. I have two different passports, you can choose the embassy you want. So in the end, I opened and I showed them he couldn't read anything because I was writing in Portuguese at the time. But I showed everything that I wrote about, you know, visiting, um, what's the name of that huge refugee camp in Palestine, in, in Gaza, in Gaza itself. Well, anyway, and every, all my travels in, in the West Bank, you name it, people that I interviewed, and after that, I never, I never came back because I refused to go through Israel, which was another thing that I learned uh, by personal experience, in fact. So this is how, ah, and much later, I had to come to grips with the or original part of the story, which was the Spanish heritage. I knew there were torturers in one of my families, my grandmother's family, which is Loyola, Jesuits. Hardcore. So one day, a friend of mine in Saragossa took me to see the catacombs where they had the torture chambers. So it took me 50 something years to understand the beginning of the whole story. So, what did I learn with this uh, people to people exchanges? Essentially, glimpses of the purity of Islam, of course, from different interlocutors and glimpses of the perversions of Islam that I saw, especially in Talibanistan at the time, when I crossed uh, everywhere. I started in Torkan and I finished in, in um, Islam Kila, the border with Iran, which was a, a mind-blowing experience to see for the first time. Uh, it was, wow, well, it was 2000, so the beginning of the millennium, uh, the end of the state, the end of uh, a Western construct, which is a function, functioning state, substituted by a seventh century interpretation of uh, a pure faith as it was. As, as it was.
in the seventh century. So this is how I learned it, and finally I understood that this East and West dichotomy created by very gifted, uh, related by very gifted imperial writers, by the way, as we all know, was a fiction. So it was possible to absolutely interact with an Ayatollah in Qom. It was possible to interact with tribal chiefs everywhere. It was totally possible to interact with Sufis all across Central Asia, like, like in Uzbekistan, or, or even in Osh, if I remember well. It was possible, it, for instance, my, my, my experience in, um, in the Arab world does not include Saudi Arabia because I was never given a visa, and then I, start, I, I didn't even apply after a while for obvious reasons. But I know the Gulf well. I went to Qatar many times. Uh, my uh, crossroads in the Gulf was usually Dubai or, or Doha or Abu Dhabi. And, and, I, and I, I could understand their perversion of Islam as well, influenced, of course, by what Wurik was saying, basically influenced by money and corrupted by money and by greed. So, uh, Okay, this is, a, this is a story that has no end and no morals because it's, it's not a Western Hollywoodish uh, story, essentially. But it's basically to say that this uh, approximation between East and West, and uh, in my case, uh, uh, abandoning Christianism, then flirting with Buddhism, then being a total atheist in a Nietzschean sense, probably, but embracing the best of Islam, which uh, I, I had il illuminations in my travels in Islamic lands. One of them, maybe the most spectacular, when I was in Mashhad in 2002, when it was not this huge complex that it is nowadays. I was probably the only foreigner the first day that I went. There were like 200,000 pilgrims and I was the only one, and I was allowed to walk around by myself. It was something, you know, unheard of. And I didn't even feel something like this when I went to Tibet, which was uh, at the time the, the holy grail, going to Jokan was the holy grail of uh, Tibetan Buddhism. Or uh, not to mention uh, visiting the Vatican, apart from the Raphael paintings. It's different. And you could feel, and you could experience this in a major Islamic temple. So what's the, what's the moral of the story, in fact? Xi Jinping is right. There's only one way to bridge East and West, people to people exchange. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the question regarding the clash of civilization, I, don't, I do not subscribe to this theory. Actually, I, I argue against it. Because the inherent theme here is that there is an inevitable clash between, as he puts it, and by the way, it's really started with Bernard Lewis, who's a well-known historian, but he's also very much uh, 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 Western-oriented and, and ethnocentrist and Zionist. Uh, his idea of clash of civilization, that's inevitable, that there is an inherent incompatibility between Islam and, and, and uh, liberal Western values. And therefore, there has to be a clash based on that. That was picked up by um, Samuel Huntington, and he basically uh, theorized in his paper and then book that there is going to be a clash of civilization either, either between Western and, and, and Confucian or Western and Islamic, and, and, and basically between this Western and Islamic. It's, it's a theory that is trying to push that concept because of the overwhelming power gap that exists today between the West and Islam in order to subdue uh, Islam and change its inherent values to the point where it can not be differentiated with Western values. They think that they have succeeded in doing that with Japanese culture and Japanese civilization and some other uh, uh, civilization. They find Islam to be extremely resistant to these kind of values that would at the end submit to the, uh, not necessarily Christian values, by the way, because it, it's when, when someone discussed that there is an inherent clash of civilization within each civilization, these are not Christian-based civilizations. 
These are basically neoliberal, uh, secular uh, civilizations that came out of the experiment of the Enlightenment and, and the Industrial Revolution and, and so on and so forth. And it does embrace these concepts uh, that in its names there was this, you know, uh, manifest destiny and imperialism and colonialism and it was thwarted to the point where uh, uh, it, 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 it made the white man basically racist in nature, and I'm not speaking generally speaking, because as I said, 90% of the people uh, uh, have very little, even in the richest part of the world, so we should not generalize, but we're talking about people with power. Uh, that's why Israel today does not represent Jewish civilization, does not represent Judaism. Israel is an extension, the Zionist movement is an extension of the nation state model that came with the neoliberal state that is trying to extend colonialism and imperialism and uh, control the resources uh, throughout the world. There's a lot to be said here, but because of time, I'm going to move on. Uh, the question of the freedom of speech and freedom of expression uh, needs to be understood in the context, again, of the development of neoliberal values in, in the U.S. And, and Europe, but U.S. in particular, because it's very wide. But it, it's extended only to living persons. So if I come today and accuse someone's mother of being a whore, he can sue me. He has to prove that she was a whore. But if you come and says, as Salman Rushdie did, that all the wives of the prophet were whores, that's freedom of expression that is not protected. Because it is only protects the private person who is being injured. Now you have to prove that somehow you are injured because you consider all the wives of the prophet as your mothers, but that, is not, that does not, uh, would not be accepted in the West. Because the religion, again, is something that is supposed to be different, although they are sensitive, and they give some sensitivity training, but they are not in that, in that realm, in that context, all right? They're going to take it literally. So there need to be an amendment. Uh, if freedom of expression, someone mentioned it, I forgot who it was, if there's going to be a, a, a to, to, to give freedom of expression, and, and, and I'm totally for that, and freedom of speech, there has to be a way also to protect the sensitivity where people are being injured by injuring their own beliefs or systems. But it's not constructed, so there has to be a balance here where it is. Uh, so private and, and um, public is an important thing. The question of racism in the U.S. Uh, U.S. Is, 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 is racist to the core, and we can see that every day. But there are also lots of gains against racism. So it, it, it has different shapes and forms. Uh, those, I didn't live in the 50s in the U.S., so, but I heard a lot of people who did, and they told me their stories. I lived in the 70s, and I saw some forms of racism. It got better. And today, you know, one day it was against the Chinese or the Japanese or the Jews or the, or the African Americans for a long, long time. Today it's against the Muslims. So it is inherent in that culture. And, and, but there are also a lot of gains on the other side, lots of pushback. So that dialectic, that dynamic is going to take place, and we have to encourage pushing back. Uh, because there are a lot of things that were done through society, things were done through law, things were done through social interaction. That's the last point which is mentioned person to person, people to people. I think this is a very important uh, tool. And to me, uh, again, one reason I believe that we were successful in, in, in defeating the government, and this is very difficult to defeat, to defeat the federal government in any court, but to defeat it twice is even unheard of. But part of that is of the way I was embraced by other people because of that connection. Because I had these relationships developed through a long time. But not people to people is not enough. You need to be society to society, organizations to organizations. You have to be a part of a movement, part of an organization, part of somewhere in which you can be recognized by not just one or two people who are your neighbors who will be powerless, but by other structures that can actually push the, the, the cases forward. I'm allowed just to additions to what you said. The first is, in our German basic law, there is a paragraph against blasphemy. So in that sense, uh, we have to look at different uh, constitutions in, in the West. Secondly, the main question you asked me in terms of compassion, and the whole question of uh, good and evil positions in religions. Um, <clears throat> I think that uh, that can be answered dialectically in the following way. Um, the kind of 
antagonism or that anti or antithetic positions is exactly then against positions that exclude compassion. So um, we could go into the historical um, rise of uh, monotheism. I always say the monotheism was created in re against money theism. It was exactly in that time when money took over that the, in the Jewish, uh, uh, particularly in the Jewish sense, but also in the Buddhism, it was against that kind of uh, this calculating power and just splitting of societies, greedy mind, etc., etc., that the that the reaction came and say no, the real ruling ruling power is not this one, but is the compassion, is the justice, is the relational. I mean, we could, cannot go into the details, but that is ev evident in Buddhism, and it is evident in ancient Israel in the uh, in the compassionate God. So, it, and that is then the tradition building up in the Abrahamic religions, Jesus and also Muhammad. So just very briefly, because we are running out of time. Just, i like to add briefly as well, probably covering two or three uh, uh, questions. Uh, on Clash of Civilizations, uh, it's a fake thesis, we all know. It's a divide and rule thesis, we all know. It's a Zionist thesis, we all know, but, why he controlled the narrative for so long and disseminated like a virus. In fact, Clash of Civilizations became a virus that infected the operating system. And the operating system works in English. If this was formulated in any other language, we would never had this kind of repercussion. But if you control the narrative, if you control the, <laughs> the means of production in this case, if you control the network, which was the case. If you control major editorials and major papers in the world, or if you control what Reuters and AP is going to distribute to be printed in a, a newspaper in Baluchistan, for instance, then you control the whole chain, right? And this, this virus, clash of civilization virus inoculated all over the, all over the West, especially, uh, was re-legitimized by 9-11, then it became even worse because 9-11 only confirmed that there is a clash of civilizations because those crazy Muslims are attacking us in our own land. And it got much worse now with the return of the neocons uh, with Trump that we're seeing, which is a whatever you want to depict it is an overall demonization of Muslims. And this you understand when you talk to somebody like Steve Bannon and what Stevie Benton is trying to do with the movement that he set up two months ago in Brussels, which is going to be a, an indoctrination en masse all across Europe because he saw the opening. And it's once again demonization of Muslims. Like uh, e even in, um, in France, for instance, Marine Le Pen before, it was not only about immigration. The number one point in her platform was that the EU is a bunch of lousy bureaucrats and we need to take France back to its roots. Nowadays, much because of the Bannon effect, because Bannon indoctrinated Salvini in Italy, now Ministry of the Interior in Italy, and Salvini re-indoctrinated Marine Le Pen, so her narrative now in France is Islam. Let's get rid of Islamic immigration. She doesn't talk about North and African immigration because apparently in France, North and Africans adapt easier and Muslims, don't, they are known adaptable. Of course, they still have the Algerian <laughs> freak out in their minds. They'll never, they'll never get rid of it, right? So, and this leads to your question about the re uh, refusal of visas because now it's fortress Europe and Muslims are by definition dangerous. So visas for Muslims are <laughs> an immeasurable potency more complicated to obtain than if you are Chinese. If you are Chinese uh, on a tour group to, to, to Europe, it's very easy. You get a Schengen visa almost automatically. If you are a Muslim from uh, especially Iran, Pakistan, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Somalia, Sudan, you're going to have a lot of trouble and probably you're not going to get a visa. So this, it's all interlinked. 
It's part of the network. And it's going to get much worse because we see the rise of the extreme right and right populism all across Europe. So Europe is going to be a, a weaponized, fearful fortress indefinitely, unfortunately. The global consequences now demand that we all focus on it. This is life or death for the planet. But I hold to the very simple principle that as a citizen of my country, it is my job to hold my country morally accountable. That is a principle that applies not only to the US, but applies to Pakistan. And having just spent two days at the National Defense University, not to make judgments about the jingoism of the Pakistani elite, but I just did, uh, I think there is a, a challenge to the people and intellectual class of Pakistan. Will you be morally responsible for your society. The other point is just it's, on, it's intellectual honesty to tell the truth about the world in which you live. But I think all of this is particularly important in the United States because remember the United States has an origin story that it is the, the force that brought freedom, peace, justice, democracy and all good things into the world. And when a country has an origin story that is so at odds with the historical reality the United States brought into the world, yes, certain ideas about democracy. It also brought into the world the most uh, extensive genocide in recorded human history with the indigenous population. It brought in a second, that's what I always call the first racialized holocaust of the United States. The second was, of course, African slavery. Both of those piled millions upon millions of bodies, devastated entire societies. And then the third, racialized holocaust of the US is the post-World War II assault on the developing world. And why that is so important to highlight is because remember also in the post-World War II world, the United States essentially wrote the UN Charter, put onto the world scene a legal apparatus based on moral principles that then it has systematically ignored and destroyed. And so there's a lot, you know, states are hypocritical. Capitalists are hypocritical. People with concentrations of wealth and power are hypocritical. I've yet to meet a single one that wasn't. Right? But I'm focused on the hypocrisy of my country because I have that moral responsibility. And I think all of us, no matter where we're from, should focus on the hypocrisy of the powerful of our country and act accordingly. Which was basically there are certain groups which are faith-based groups in every city they come together for social action, social justice action. We were the only mosque, actually, and we were, we were not the normal. This is the, the aberrant, you know, this is the, the very few mosques get involved in that. We were 19 churches and one mosque, and we were getting together to attack or deal with social justice actions. This kind of, I, didn't, I wouldn't call it inner faith because we respect each other, but we don't go there to talk about religion. We go there to talk about what our communities need and how we can get it done in the same way as other uh, community-based uh, uh, organized action takes place. Uh, yes, yes, they do. And right now, I'll tell you what the, what the, uh, what the actual plan is. And this was written by one of the uh, uh, more, more uh, insightful strategic thinkers of his time, and he does affect American strategic thinking, and he, he is distinguished by saying it plainly. He doesn't play with words. And basically, he wrote an article. His name is George Friedman. He is the founder of Strat4. He has now geopolitical futures. And um, he wrote in uh, February of 2017, a few weeks after uh, Trump uh, took over and became president, is that the US was faced with three choices, strategic choices, after 9-11. One was to invade every region, every country, from Morocco to Indonesia. And of course, they had a plan to attack seven countries. He said, after the second country, we couldn't even continue. We're not even done with Afghanistan, let alone do all this. So this was a failure. We don't have the resources to do it. Two was to withdraw. And this is what, in his opinion, what Obama partially tried to do. And he said, this is, this is a very dangerous uh, strategy, because even if we go, they're going to come back after us, in his view. He said, the best strategy to use, and this is his recommendation, to the American um, administration, which he has given before he wrote this article, was to use what we, in his words, what we always used before, which is to look at our enemy, divide them into a weak part and a strong part, ally ourselves with the weak, attack the strong, and then come back and attack the weak. He gave the two examples. He said during the 1976 independence uh, of the US, 
we had we allied ourselves effectively with the French against the British. After the British were done, we went after the French, and we got, of course, everything France had in the U.S. The second example was during the World War II. We we allied ourselves with our nemesis, the Soviet Union, to defeat Hitler, and then we came back and it took us 40 years, 45 years to come back and defeat the Soviet Union. Now, what is it before us? The Islamic world. What is the biggest fault line that existed over a thousand years? Very easy. Sunni Shia divide. Let's divide them into Sunni and Shia. Let's, and then he says, we have then a decision to make. Should we ally ourselves with the Shia against the Sunni or with the Sunni against the Shia? Uh, Obama wasn't too sure. He was trying to see maybe the Shia against the Sunni. Trump obviously has allied himself with the Sunni against the Shia. Thank you. This brings um, us to the end of the program. Uh, I thank all the panel for such an enlightening and educating talk. I would request Dr. Anis Ahmed, the chair of the uh, symposium, uh, to give his input. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, I'm so privileged to hear the scholars who in their own right deserve appreciation. Um, I have learned a lot in these uh, few minutes. I don't have add too much except I believe that colonialism and globalization are twins. They were born nearly in the same age, one in South Africa through roads and the other through colonization in, of Europe elsewhere. And they have grown together as twins. The problem, as I see, has not been just a matter of religion. It's a matter of economic and political power. And therefore, capitalist economy and imperialism work together to serve each other. And that's what we find today. Uh, the problem is, I think, deeply a matter of um, hermeneutical gap between Muslims and between cultures. Uh, when you talk about freedom of speech, a North American, a European, a Palestinian, an Iranian, a Pakistani will have different views completely. We never realize that. When you talk about Americans, it's one thing to say that state terrorism has harmed a lot and has done devastations. But to generalize that Americans as such is wrong. America has human beings like us. Their only crime is they are confined to their county, not beyond that. They read their county newspaper. They watch football, they eat TV dinner, they enjoy life. They know nothing about the world around. You may disagree with me, but that's how I look at it. Therefore, many of them are innocent. They don't know what Trump is doing to them. And Trump does not represent Americans either. He represents a maximum of 21% block of racist in America. And he knows the number game, therefore he was able to get to power with this 21% block. Therefore we should not generalize. I believe person-to-person -person relationship is the core of any bright future. Islam came to fight against shirk but not against mushrikeen. It wanted to eliminate shirk by inviting mushrikeen to Islam. Therefore, it should not be a matter of eliminating one by the other, but a matter of reaching out, interacting, and trying to come up with uh, uh, overcoming gaps of communication. I think the hermeneutical gap is the biggest. Terminology, concepts, everything is different. Huntington has made things easy, and I quote from him, what he says is, you cannot be modernized without being westernized, unquote. Again he says, 
it's not a matter of Islamic fundamentalism, but Islam as such. Unquote. So he has made things very easy for us to identify. But this bias has existed not because of religious conflict, but because of lack of knowledge. And in that, I think, Muslims are to be equally blamed, not just the colonizers. Colonizability is more dangerous than the colonization. If you accept you're colonized, then you are doing a bigger crime than colonizer. We accept you're colonized, loved it. Even today we have it. I talk with you in English, not in Urdu. A remnant of colonization. So we have to look differently and be very honest and fair to ourselves and to others. Control our emotions and take a rational path which can only open further vistas of knowledge, mutual respect, communication and trust. And that's not a matter of overnight. It may take even a century, but if you make a proper beginning, it's bound to bring results. Well, uh, I was thinking not to make any comment at all, but to just uh, remember my very, very dear brother, Mumtaz, uh, perhaps uh, among those who lived and uh, uh, survived the past so many decades, I am one of those few who are living and who had longest experience of companionship with Mumtaz. It was in late 50s he came to Karachi. I was finishing my graduation and I joined Karachi University as a young lecturer. And he was studying in political science department. And uh, there was hardly a day when we will not meet. He lived in our home for some time. He was part of our family always. Uh, what I like always, Muntaz was very honest, upright, and a thorough Pakistani. Throughout his career in the U.S., I listened to BBC comments which he used to make. And quite often we'll exchange views on telephone and letters. When he joined a research institute in Karachi, where emphasis was on Islamic studies, he learned a lot about Islam. And since then, I start calling him Molbi Mumtaz. <laughs> he never felt unhappy on that. Rather, he loved it. And fortunately, few hours before he passed away, he gave me his book on education and wrote on it for Professor Brother Anis Ahmed from Molbi Mumtaz. So throughout uh, our companionship from late uh, 50s till he passed away, a long period, don't guess my age on that, <laughs> uh, we have been very, very close in interaction, exchange of ideas, and learning from each other. I cannot <laughs> reconcile till now with his death. <laughs> Thank you very much.